All right, we are live on Facebook Live, and we are here on Tuesday evening, 8.30 p.m., and uh, again, Eastern Standard Time, uh, for those of you that are living in other countries, uh, make sure that you account for the, the time difference. But I guess you would <laughs> you would already be uh, dealing with that now. I guess uh, I dealt with somebody in the Philippines that it would be 930 tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah, um, uh, again, she got on. She's supposed to be getting on uh to tonight so lord willing you know people will know uh we're on live right now doing a bible q and a and um i hope that um you brought your questions with you i hope that you brought a good spirit with you and we're going to attempt me and uh brother justin here are going to attempt to answer your questions according to the bible and we're going to try to uh do less of giving our opinions but you know there are some areas where sometimes you have to but uh, but whether there's opinion, we'll let you know that it's opinion. But if it's Bible, you know, we're going to let you know it's the Bible. OK, so um, go ahead, Justin. Go ahead and open up, man. All right. Well, uh, I guess to to deal specifically with the issue about um, free will and God's sovereignty, just because it was brought up sovereign in its most basic definition just means supreme ruler. However, however. Today, the terminology when used to describe God as sovereign is always associated with um, the doctrines of, and I would say for some people, Calvin. But Calvin got his doctrine, of course, from um, Augustine, and Augustine got his doctrine, of course, from Greek fatalism. So it, it's the idea that God knows and has foreordained everything there is before the foundation of the world. And that is incorrect, according to the Bible. Uh, to start, the word sovereign is actually not found in the Bible at all. The King James Bible is, uh, of course, the pure and perfect word of God. And nowhere in the book of, of, uh, of the Bible do you see the word sovereign. And uh, I guess to deal with that, um, I would say most of the issue stems from the fact or the idea that people don't know how to reconcile the idea that God doesn't know everything. And I, I say that with all honor and respect for the God, the creator of the universe, but they'll, they'll say, well, you know, God writes in the book of Revelation and, he t and he, he's writing about the people that are saved, the saints, and all that's going to happen then. Well, doesn't he know everyone who's going to be saved? Right? So they would think, of course, yes, he should know everyone that's going to be saved. But according to the Bible, you don't get a specific number in Revelation. You get a thousand, thousand, and thousands Amen. of thousands. Amen. So you have this general number in a book where the specific number of days are given, the specific number of, of years are given, specific number of kings are given, specific number of nations are given. So you have all of these extraordinary details in the book of Revelation. But when it comes to the number of saved people or the number of the saints, there's not a specific number given. And I think to start off... That's good. Scripture. That's good. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter number 15, and we'll clarify this. Acts chapter number 15. <clears throat> so if you're following along in the book of Acts chapter number 15, if you look over at verse number 18, the Bible says, Known unto God are all his works. Do you see that? Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. See, God knows everything he is going to do. It doesn't say that he knows everything you and I are going to do. You could choose to go and slap your neighbor 
or you could choose to not go and slap your neighbor. You have the free will to do so. If you do so, God knows exactly what he's going to do to deal with you for it. If you don't do so, God knows exactly what he's going to do. So nothing is going to hinder God or prevent God from doing what it is he has uh, set out to do. But that's big picture stuff. What you and I do with our everyday lives is a matter of our own free will. And uh, I'll just add one, one more scripture verse there, and we'll, we'll let Ed take on here. Turn to Leviticus chapter 22. Leviticus chapter number 22. And if you would, look unto verse number 17. Leviticus 22, verse number 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, Who... Whatsoever he be of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel that will offer his oblation for all his vows and for all his, look at that, free will offerings, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering. Ye shall offer, look at verse number 19, ye shall offer at your own will. You see that? Ye shall offer at your own will. A male without blemish of the beeves, of the sheep, or of the goats. Uh, but whatsoever hath a blemish, that shall you not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. So God's giving you direction on how to sacrifice. He says, here's what I want. If you want to sacrifice, if you want to offer something to me, here's what I find acceptable. And then he says, it's up to you if you want to do that or not. All right. Um, let me go ahead and uh, make a comment on that. Uh, I've got a few things to say, but before we dive into that, uh, Brother Justin, I've got a question here. Sure. But it's, it's going to be off topic. Now, I'm going to ask the question, and then while I give my side of the, you know, the the question here of is God sovereign or do humans have free will, I'm going to give my uh, half of it. It won't be that long. It'll give you time to look up Brady's question. Okay. So sure. here it is. Okay. If you are taking other questions, first John five sixteen to 17, what do these verses mean? What is the sin unto death? Okay. So um, I'm going to uh, open up with my uh, side about uh, is God sovereign or does man have free will? Um, on, on my end, um, I agree with everything brother Justin said. And um, I just want to uh, just kind of reinforce some history on this thing. When we're dealing with this kind of uh, logic and reasoning about is God sovereign uh, versus does man have free will, you've got a, a problem with the premise in itself because you would have to define the word sovereign first, and then you'd have to define free will. Because depending on your definitions of those words will de determine uh, objectively what we're going to believe about those things. So um, really quickly, there are three divisions of Calvinism. You have hyper-Calvinists, you have hyper-repentance, and you have reformed Calvinists. So Calvinists that are serious about what they believe what, what we call fundamentalists, they don't believe in no gospel, no repentance, no faith, no witnessing, everything's predetermined. That's hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-repentance is uh, a form of Calvinism, which is any unconfessed, unrepentant sin proves you were never saved to begin with. But there are sins in your life you don't even know about, and that's my appeal to that. But then nobody could be saved then. But hyper repentance, that's, that's what, uh, another form of Calvinism that a lot of people believe today, which is unscriptural. And then you have reformed Calvinists. This is traditional Calvinism based upon the teachings. And, and I'm not saying they only believe on these teachings, but it's exclusive to the basic teachings of John Calvin on the acronym TULIP. 
Now, tulip just means in a nutshell, and uh, we're not going to go deep into this, total depravity, that's the T in tulip, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Now, that's that's the acronym. That's TULIP right there. And I would say four of those Four of those uh, beliefs are unscriptural, and you may be able to prove some of the fifth one, but it very, very questionably. Okay, so um, there you go. We, I wanted to open up with a little bit of tulip there to show that the definition of sovereign is in your mainline media, in the secular media, in secular world today, is based upon what the Calvinists define as sovereign. They're going to define it this way. But what happens is, since there's a lot of Calvinists out there, a lot of Calvinists have wrote a lot of books, and a lot of their teachings are out there in the world today, and in most of the commentaries are basically Calvinistic commentaries, you're going to bump into this definition of sovereign as God already knows everything before you even do it. Uh, from the foundation of the world, God foreordained everything to happen before it happens. God already knows everything you're going to do before you do it. And that's what they mean by sovereign. Now, that's not the only definition of sovereign in the Bible. Okay. There, there, uh, sovereign actually means mighty ruler or highest ruler. Okay. But, um, you would ask the question, where does sovereign, where is the word sovereign in the Bible? And you'll not find that word sovereign anywhere in the Bible. But then again, you always have the argument, you'll not find the word Bible in the Bible either. You'll not find the word millennial reign or rapture in the Bible. But as long as the teachings are there, then you're safe to use the word sovereign if that's what it means. And you found a verse that means that. Now, I'll give you one verse here, and then I'll pass it over to Justin. Uh, it, maybe he can answer Brady Horton's question, okay? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. This is the this is the describing God himself. It does not use the word sovereign here, okay? And the Bible says, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Potentate in its Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary is, I'm, I'm going to read it to you really quick. Hold on, let me let me flip my screen here. Hold on, I'm frozen up. Ah, come on. Okay, well, it's it, it basically I was just going to tell you that's what lines up with the word sovereign. It actually means sovereign ruler. Okay, um, I'll, I'll let go. I'll let, let Justin go ahead and take over as my my uh, computer gets loading over here. Go ahead, brother. Sure, sure. And one one more thing I will add just to this argument while while we're dealing with this. I think the other big issue found in the idea of Calvinism, fatalism, uh, God's ultimate sovereignty as far as it's used by heretics, uh, I would tell you this. What it does is it leaves man free from accountability. Correct. See, right. no nothing is my fault. God purposed it all from the beginning of the world. So if I go shoot some guy... God purposed that. That's not true. Of course, take, take it in context. God didn't purpose that. God didn't purpose sin. God didn't purpose death. But the wages of sin is death. So when you sin, that's what, that's what happens. And we'll, we'll look at that question here in just a second. But that, what, what most people do is they find an escape or they can blame God. God, it, listen, if God foreordained everything from the foundation of the world, God is the author. If, if that's what someone believes, they're, they're saying God is the author of rape. God is the author of murder. And that's not true, right. according to the Bible. Amen. God is not the, the author of sin. Satan is the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. None of that had to do with God. God is the God of life and light, and love, and peace, and grace, and mercy. All of those good things came from God. Man's sin brought death. So anyway, just to throw that in there, a lot of Amen. people find an excuse for accountability when they, when they claim to those doctrines. So <clears throat> to look at uh, uh, Mr. Brady Horton's question here, 
uh, 1 John 5, 16 and 17. Let's go ahead and read it so we can get that uh, out there. It says, <clears throat> 1 John 5, chapter, or 1 John 5, verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So, verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So what's he talking about here? Obviously, he's talking about dealing with a man's life. And he says, if you see someone committing a sin or involved in a sin, sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, go and tell him, what are you doing? Why would you do this? What's, you know, you ask him, what does it say? And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. So you're giving that man the opportunity to repent. However, you say, well, what does that mean, a sin unto death? Well, the closest thing I could find to a cross-reference here, and, and we'll look at something else, too, with regards to that. But look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Let's see, just because there's no better place to start, verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 1, the Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. That's disgusting. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that, that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath, done, that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at this, verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So this sin, fornication, one of them, there's a couple other mentioned that, that, that is a, that's serious to the point where you're put out of fellowship. Right here, God says, you deliver that one unto Satan. What does it say? For the destruction of the flesh. That's death. That's death. Though the, Seems quite clear from Scripture. There are sin. There are sins that bring with them greater punishment or um, greater consequence in the here and now. And and just to show you further along those lines, let me get back to First John five here. Look at um, Jeremiah eleven. And verse number 14, Jeremiah 11, and verse number 14, 11, verse 14, oh, verse, actually go back to verse 11, Jeremiah 11, 11. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods, unto whom they offer incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah. And according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have ye set up altars to the shameful to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. God said, Jeremiah, these people have gone so far down the road of wickedness. I'm not going to listen. The punishment is coming. I am going to send Babylon. They are going to kill them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. And, and then the remnant I'm going to 
carry back to Babylon. And you can pray all you want, but I'm not going to listen to you. First John chapter, chapter 5, what do you say in verse, verse 16? Uh, I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now, one that is spiritual, you should try and restore your brother. It's not like you've got complete insight and wisdom from God to know where someone is along the, that road. But um, if uh, uh, clearly from the scripture, there is a point whereby God wouldn't listen if you were praying. And I'm not saying that's for uh, any particular thing. Because like I said, I don't have insight to know where someone is on that road. But clearly there's sin that brings with it greater punishment in this day and in this time, uh, in the here and now. But, uh, but also that people reach a point where God wouldn't listen if, if people were praying. So, Brother Ed, you're more than welcome to add to that or clarify. Or... Yes, sir. Yeah, I looked it up in my notes. I have some notes here that might be helpful as well. Appreciate the answer there, Justin. Uh, yeah, you, you listen to his answer. It, it, it's, uh, it's probably going to be uh, the same thing I'm about to say anyways, okay? So uh, if you go to your Bible in Psalm 1913, Psalm 1913, and we'll go back one verse, and we'll go, go back to verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Now, what are presumptuous sins? Those are sins that are willingful sins. These, you're going into the, to, to the sin knowing you're sinning. Okay. A presumptuous sin is purposefully, willingfully sinning. So keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Now, um, we, we'll probably be a little bit more subjective here than objective because uh, you could say the great tra transgression could be a number of things. However, if you line it up with the rest of the Bible, um, as uh, Justin did so graciously earlier with 1 Corinthians 5, I, I, you did quote that, right? 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 5. Yes. Um, uh, you're you given over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Uh, the focus of the spirit being saved, you know, the, that would be the, the well being of the, of the conscience and the mind. Okay. So if you look at, cause Justin mentioned fornication is one of those sins that are sins of the body. Now I want to, I want to reinforce that. With First Corinthians six nineteen. Now, First Corinthians six nineteen to twenty, and I just we're just going to reinforce what Justin said. And as 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 this unfolds, you'll see your question being answered. The Bible says, "What know ye not that your body? See the body there. The body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price." Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. But if you read back to verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So it's a sin against your own body. That's pretty serious. Now go to 1 Corinthians 3.16, and we're going to see the same concept. Know ye not that, you're t that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now look at verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, which is what? The body, right? Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Okay, so when we're dealing with the body and sins against the body, that can be the great transgression that's being discussed about in the book of Psalms. And what we're dealing with in First John, it's willingly defiling your body, knowing that you're sinning against the holy God who sent his son to die for you, and you still want to defile yourself. It's presumptuous sins. Now, now watch this. Go to Romans 6.16. Go to Romans 6.16. And the Bible says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants 
or you yield yourselves servants to obey. Okay, so who, whatever you yield to, that's what you're going to be obeying, right? So if you hang around the wrong people out in the world, you're going to be just like them, right? You're going to obey them. But if you if you yield to the things of God, guess what you're going to be like? Guess what you're going to be obedient to? The things of God. So his servants, ye are to whom ye obey. Now watch. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, if you look at that context of what we just read, we are dealing with yielding, and yielding is dealing with a choice, which means John Calvin's wrong. Mm. Very good. For, for you to yield to something would be implying you're having choice there. For, for obedience implies choice in, a, in of itself. So you can go anywhere in the Bible and disprove Calvinism because God is always asking us to yield for us to choose to obey him. Because when you obey God, it's showing God you love him. See, by obedience, you know, in, in, in obeying the word of God comes love. OK, so by obeying God, you show you love God. Now, really quickly, if I don't obey willingly, my presumptuous sin of willingly not obeying and I'm going to sin against God willingly, there's a sin unto death there. Now, I would say the sin against the body, according to the Bible, is the actual act of fornication. We could even zoom in on that and making it fornication. But I contend it could be any sin that you would yield to and devote your affections towards and devote your time towards and devote your love towards and willingly obeying that will leave you to where you give yourself over to a reprobate mind in which God gives you over to a reprobate mind. God will not give you over to something you don't give yourself over to first. That's Romans one. Okay. So we're talking about this sin unto death. Now, let me hit you maybe with one more here. Uh, Galatians 5.19. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. Use that as a cross-reference. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication. The first two mentioned are sins against the body. And it's a, it's a sin of the flesh. And I think a sin against the body, according to 1 Corinthians 10.8, and 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And 1 Corinthians 10.8 says, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. So let's take everything we just learned in the Bible just now. I know we don't have a Bible to show on the screen, but take everything we just went over and lump some that all together. The sin unto death in 1 John chapter 5 is something that you, you've given yourself over to, and fornication could possibly be that specific sin, or it could be any sin that you are giving yourself over to, yielding yourselves to, giving yourself over to that thing in which God gives you over to that thing. And this is what we call a reprobate mind. A sin unto death would be a reprobate mind. Some, somebody that, not saying he can't come back to God, but somebody that doesn't want to come back to God. Okay, now Justin can add uh, anything you want, brother. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I mean, that that pretty much touches it. And you going back to Romans 1, um, <clears throat> the Bible says, uh, let, let's go back there real quick. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, if you look at verse number 23, uh, 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. <clears throat> They're going down that road. They're not interested in repenting. They're not interested in turning to God. God says, okay, I give you up. There you go. Go go ahead and do that stuff. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause, man just continued down that road. God gave them up unto vile affections. 
And you can keep reading, but then uh, verse number uh, 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So, I mean, it's, it's a downward progression. It's not they just were born that way or they were formed that way or anything along those lines. Amen. They chose that way. Um, I suppose that'd be sufficient if you want to go more along the lines of um, God not, not answering the prayer with regards to that or not hearing that prayer. Take a look at Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. And the Bible says in verse number 9, He that turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. And you can see similar references in uh, Jeremiah 7, 16. We saw Jeremiah 14, uh, Proverbs chapter 1, Psalm 80, verse 4, Psalm 109, verse 7, Zechariah 7, 13, Micah 3, 4. Lots of places in the scripture, God gives reference to the fact that People have, when, when a particular person or a nation or a group have gone so far down the road of wickedness, is, I'm not even listening. If they were to pray or you were to pray for them, uh, somewhere in Jeremiah, God says, though Noah, Daniel, and Job withstood me, they would deliver themselves for their own righteousness, but I'd still destroy the rest of the city. Amen. They wouldn't listen. And elsewhere in the Psalms, God makes reference to Moses and Samuel withstanding him and, mm -hmm. and offering up prayer to, to intercede. God said, I wouldn't listen to them either. So it, it's, it's just in the scripture. And I guess people are kind of shocked when they hear that kind of thing. But, boy, you ought to consider God is not a cream puff marshmallow who's just going to do whatever people ask him to do. Right. <laughs> Man, I know that sounds rough, but it's true. Why should God deliver anybody? Period. Now, praise the Lord, he delivers lots of people. He's merciful to lots of people. He's gracious to, I mean, really to everyone. He's merciful and gracious and kind and long-suffering. But you keep pushing that long-suffering, there is an end. Right. At some point, there comes wrath. At some point, there comes condemnation. At some point, there comes justice. So, anyway, I just I'd caution saved and lost. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to. Uh, what's it say uh, in Galatians chapter six? I do not frustrate the grace of grace of God. God. I, I wouldn't want to frustrate no. His grace. I wouldn't want to tempt the Lord. The Bible says, "Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God." What is that verse? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to reap what you sow. It's coming. Amen. Amen. Uh, let, let, me, let me share with you what, uh, what my pastor said, <laughs> what he said <laughs> about that verse. He said, a saved member of the body of Christ, as a saved member of the body of Christ, there is a sin you can commit that no one can pray for because God is going to take you out no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way out of it man um just look don't pray that you commit that sin <laughs> all right you know let's just be obedient to god i mean we shouldn't have to try to find out the extreme of what's going to take me out that way we can worry about not committing it let's just honor god in our lives we don't have to worry about that <laughs> all right let's let's get a move on we got a few people made some comments here i was just trying to see if there was any questions Okay, we got da David Kumar. God bless you always. Well, God bless you too. But most of all, you couldn't be blessed unless you were saved, David Kumar. Um, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Um, a lot of people think as long as they call themselves a Christian or own a Bible that they're, they're, they're good to go to heaven. And you got to believe that Christ died for your sins and rose again the third day. And if you trusted that and believed on that, you're saved. And I hope that uh, you would, uh, if you haven't trusted Christ, that you do that. And if you have, just keep living your life for Jesus Christ. All right, David. Um, amen. And then uh, we've got Ashley Barnes Edmonds. Got on here and said, shared 
in North Carolina. We appreciate you sharing that. Uh, so glad Tim and uh, Hallie invited me to this. Hey Amen. Well, I'm Amen. glad you're you're on here. And uh, and then you actually mentioned this comment here. Can we ask anything? And then our friend Isaac Cabrera answered and said, "Yes." Appreciate that. <laughs> Appreciate that, Isaac. <laughs> Amen. And then, uh, then he says, it's a Q&A. Ask anything Bible-related, and they'll give you an answer. Amen, Isaac. Appreciate that. And then she says, thank you, Isaac. Uh, Amen. Amen. Good good conversation going on in here. Um, it makes sense. <laughs> Amen. All right. So speaking of making sense, uh, go ahead, Justin, if you want to get back on track with our uh, yes. where, where we left off on yes. – so getting back on track on the, uh, the idea of uh, a man's free will, um, as the Calvinists may use it, uh, God's sovereignty. So let, let's take a look at another passage in Scripture. I think it's instrumental to, to understanding this kind of thing. Look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter number 33. And we're, I mean, we're, we're going to answer the question about God's sovereignty and man's free will from the Bible. Right? I mean, that's, that's what you and I need. We need help. We need wisdom. We need knowledge. Where are we going to get it? You got to get it from the word of God. Otherwise, it's a bad source. If it's just me, I'm faulty. I'm sinful. If it's just you, you're faulty. You're sinful. So we're going to look to the words of God to give us guidance, truth, teaching. Correct. Amen. Right. And, uh, so we're going to start here in Ezekiel chapter 33. And uh, let's see. Let's go with, well, just because it's a great place to start. Verse number seven, Ezekiel 33, verse number seven, the Bible says, so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman on the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus he speaks, saying, If our transgressions, uh, where was I? If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye. Turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And we'll pause right there for just a moment. We'll dive right back in. But uh, look at what he said. He said, when there's a wicked man, and I have given you my word to go and warn that wicked man to turn from his iniquity. If he doesn't turn, he's going to die. And that's on him. Right now, look at that. Look at the, just, just look at that when we're starting off with this. God said to Ezekiel, go and warn that man, and he has the choice to turn from his sin. If he doesn't, he dies. If he does, he can deliver himself. If he does, he can live, right? And look at verse number 12. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. So pause there for a moment. A man who is righteous, right? If I guess if you were Calvinistic, you might say that he, uh, he was chosen before the foundation of the world. But if that man commits wickedness, if that man commits transgression, his righteousness won't deliver him. Look at the rest of the verse. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. 
When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. See, God just shows you. He's, he gives people the option. Now, of course, we know with New Testament light, no man has righteousness to deliver himself. No man's without sin. No man's without iniquity. So we all need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can save us. But God says, of all the people in the world, we're, we're all sinners, we're all wicked. If we would turn from that, if we would repent, we would follow after the Lord. And we can see in Romans and, and other places, if, you, if you're following after God, seeking after righteousness, he'll give you the truth. He'll show you the light. He'll show you the gospel whereby you can be saved. But, uh, but he gives people the choice. And that's what we see here in this passage. People have the choice on whether or not they want to do right, live right, follow after the Lord or not. And there's going to be consequence on either side of that. Go ahead, Brother Ed. All right. Um, before we, uh, before I dive in more into this, <laughs> I got a lot to say, but um, appreciate everything you said already. Amen. Um, we're going to go on with some of these comments here. I think we got more. Um, let me get these on the screen here. Okay, here it is. We've got a comment by Isaac Caprera. What is your thoughts on the rapture? Amen. What is your, what is your thoughts on the rapture? Okay, um, I've got a few thoughts on a rapture. Ahead, um, uh, I believe that, according to the Bible, that the rapture, the word itself isn't in the Bible, but the teaching certainly is there. And the argument is always the word rapture isn't in the Bible. And again, I'm going to say, if you want to call it the come up hither, call it the come up hither. If you want to call it the coming of the blessed hope, call it the coming of the blessed hope. But uh, I call it a rapture. And uh, I believe the rapture is, can, is eminent at any time. It could come at any moment. Paul believed it could, the rapture could have came in his day. And we need to always be looking up for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back and take us up in the clouds to meet him in the air. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, 18, and 19. You can also cross-reference that with 1 Corinthians 15, 52, 53, 54, 55. You can cross-reference it, Re Revelation 4, 1. Uh, you have a, a picture of the rapture there when John... Uh, when the, when God told John, "Come up hither," you and then you don't read about the church anymore after Re, uh, Revelation four, and you know why? Because there's a rapture that came and and brought the church to heaven, and you also have uh, more, I mean, numerous uh, passages of scripture that talk about a rapture, not just those; those are the main ones we go to, but there's a whole lot about the rapture. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, and you say, "Well, how how does it talk about rapture in the Old Testament?" Well, if that's if it's really curious, because you wouldn't see it if you didn't have the light of the New Testament to shed that uh, those truths on the Old Testament. But just to give you a few, there are types of rapture in the Old Testament. One of them is Enoch. Enoch is a type of rapture in the Old Testament. And uh, Noah, because uh, think about this, uh, Enoch did not see the flood. God took him, for he was not. Who went through the flood? Well, Noah and his family members, right? They are a type of Israel going through the tribulation. Enoch, Enoch was taken by God. He's a type of church. And then look, look at Noah. Noah in Genesis 7, 16 um, no, not, not Noah. I'm sorry. Uh, Job, Job is a type. Um, you have Isaac and Rebecca is a type. 
the adulteress who was about to get stoned is a picture of the rapture. Women with the, the woman with the issue of blood and virtue goes out of Jesus when touching his garment. She disappears. She's a type of rapture. Uh, Ruth disappears. She's a type of rapture. Rahab. Rahab disappears. She's a type of rapture. Uh, what do we got? Uh, I, I, uh, let's talk about Elijah. Remember Elijah was taken up? He's a type of rapture. Um, Isaac meeting Rebecca. He's a type of rapture. Daniel during the fiery furnace. Where was Daniel at? Well, we got a, we got a type of, of rapture right there, a type of church. Um, what else? Uh, a few more. I'll give you a few more. These are neat. Uh, we've got uh, Asenath, the Gentile bride of Joseph, gets uh, is kept from famine. She's a, she's a type of, of rapture. Uh, Saul of Solomon, uh, rise up, come away, the type of Christ tells the bride. Uh, the Apostle John, the voice speaking to him like a trumpet, come up here. The Apostle Paul, a man in Christ, called up to the third heaven. That was in 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, uh, there's, there, there's some more types of, of church, types of rapture. Uh, the Lord Jesus' first ascension, type of rapture of the church. Can't touch the spiritual kingdom. Uh, John 20, verse 17, after the second ascension, you now have the physical kingdom. Uh, John 20, 27, the church is raptured. Revelation 4, 1, we talked about that. Uh, the come up hither and Proverbs 25, 7. Uh, and uh, I'll just stop right there. I got a lot more, but I'll let Justin say a few on that. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, sure. I mean, that that pretty much covers it. That's that's how this thing is. In fact, interestingly enough, the the uh, the saving of souls is likened unto a harvest, and a harvest, just like any harvest, has three three um, sections, if you will, three phases. Uh, you have the first fruits, the main harvest, and the gleanings. Of course. Um, we read about uh, all through the scripture. God makes reference of the first fruits, the harvest, and the gleanings. Uh, you also have three mentions of the term, the, the, the phrase, come up hither. Right? Now, the first one is actually in the Old Testament. You have a, a reference to the, to the Old Testament saints is what it would appear. A come up hither for them. You've got... Uh, which, of course, we saw in the book of Matthew, chapter 28. What does the Bible say? That many of the dead saints, which were, uh, or many of the saints which slept, arose, right? Their grave was open. They rose with the Lord. They walked into the city. They showed themselves alive. And where'd they go? He led captivity captive. He took them up into heaven, took those saints up into heaven. That's the first come up hither. Then we read, of course, in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1, the Lord says to John, and who, who's John, of course? He's a member of the church through faith in Jesus Christ. What do you say? Come up hither. That's the, that's the taking away of the church up into heaven just before the great tribulation falls. And, of course, then you've got in the time of the great tribulation when the two witnesses die and their bodies are laid out for uh, three and a half days, whatever it is. And then uh, at the end of that, God says to them, come up hither. What do you have? The tribulation saints, the gleanings. So you have it very well laid out just as any, any harvest in scripture, your gleaning or your first fruits, the old Testament saints, the main harvest, the church in this day and this age, and then of course the gleanings, the saints of the tribulation. So, very good, brother. Very good. I like how you mentioned that the first fruits, the harvest, and the gleanings. That's uh, that is uh, consistent with scripture. For somebody to deny the rapture is to deny a whole lot of Bible truth. A whole lot of the Bible will not make sense without the rapture. Uh, in its place in the scriptures. Uh, the Bible teaches it. It's not that we're placing that in there. And many would like to say that this is some kind of a, a paganistic teaching or some kind of a Catholic teaching or some kind or somebody placed that uh, back in the days in the Bible when the early Christians did not believe that. Now, 
you have, I've, I've heard some of these teachings out there and I did find a document. I, that's what I was, that's what I've been looking for while Justin was talking. I was looking for my uh, copy of the document that I had that uh, Christianity was taught, I think earlier than the, than the 18th century or, or, or the, uh, the rapture was taught earlier than the 18th century. I think they were saying it was a, uh, nothing before the 18th century you could find. And I, I'm not sure if it's the 18th century. I'm just making a guess right now, but I'm trying to find a document, but, um, but the look, whether or not I can find a document in history or not, my my final authority is the scriptures. And yeah. n- nobody is convincing me, even if you have a document from the first century, that nobody taught the, the rapture. You've got to have to prove that scripturally out of the Bible. And the best I've seen anybody ever do was uh, coupling up Matthew 24 <laughs> with First Thessalonians 4. And you're not going to get rapture or no rapture out of that. What you're going to get is Matthew 24 doesn't have anything to do with First Thessalonians 4. That's what you're going to get if you're honest in your Bible reading. If you read Matthew 24 in context, you're going to find that this is dealing with the nation of Israel in a future time. And if you read First Thessalonians 4, this is dealing with a church that's eminent that could happen at any time. Okay, so right there, just to be honest with integrity in the scriptures, you are not going to come up with a post tribulational rapture or a mid tribulational rapture view, meaning you're going through the tribulation. That is completely ridiculous. God is not going to put his bride through tribulation. He's not going to punish his bride. I, I just come on. When you get married, do you like beat your your wife before you're married to her? Now, now, if you do, that'd be, come on. I mean, we need to get you some help. Um, but uh, no, nobody does that. Okay. So why would God put his bride through tribulation? You say to purify her. So if, if that's how you purify your bride and that's the norm of how you do it, that's not scriptural. Like, like I'm going to say that again. You've got issues. You got problems. And so again, Justin said it very nicely uh, about the, the likening unto the first fruits, the harvest, and the gleanings, and then we're dealing with the first resurrection. Um, the first resurrection is is what we what we're dealing with in that, and we are part of that first resurrection um, when we go up with the dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're part of that first resurrection, even though we didn't die yet. We're still part of that first resurrection because our bodies will be changed like unto His glorious body, and you can find all that. All that what you call opinion that I'm spouting out of my mouth right now, you can find that in First First Corinthians 15. Just read the whole chapter. All right, um, let's see what else we got, brother. Good question, Isaac. Um, okay, we got Tim and Holly Crotts. Evening, brethren. Keep up the good work. <laughs> How you doing? All right. Let's see what else. Okay, I think we I think we covered some of that too right here. Uh, Isaac asked the question. I'll rephrase that: Does it happen before or after the tribulation when Christ comes back for His people? And uh, if you want to add to that, brother, you're more more than welcome. Yeah. Sure. So uh, in the scripture, of course, with all the types, brother Ed pointed to, it's before the tribulation, right? The tribulation in the book of Jeremiah, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And, uh, and the church has to be, um, well, well, we'll, we'll get there in a second, actually, because I, I want to get to that a little bit later. But if you see Revelation chapter 4, we mentioned this passage, but let, let's go there. Um, and really, man, it's, let's take an overview of the, of the book of Revelation. Okay, so turn with me to the book of Revelation. Let's look at uh, chapter... Number one. All right. I'm just going to skim through here. I want you to look at some of these things. Uh, Let's see. Verse number four. John to the seven churches. See that? To the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Uh, Let's go on. Trying to skim through this here. 
Verse number 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Uh, let's go verse number 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden stars candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches first uh, chapter two verse number one under the angel of the church of ephesus right look at um verse number seven he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches and look at verse number eight under the angel of the church in smyrna and verse number 11, Spirit saith unto the churches. And uh, verse number 12, uh, Angel of the Church at Perg in Pergamos. And I mean, we could, we could be here for a little while, but you see, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, under the Angel of the Church in Sardis. And uh, verse number 6, Spirit saith unto the churches. 7, Angel of the Church in Philadelphia. Church, 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 church. Chapter 4, verse number 1. After, after this, after what? The churches. 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Hither. Amen. And I will show thee things which must be here after after what after the churches after the churches 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 you get to revelation 4 1 the church who is john pictured there and church is one body right so if, if the church is in heaven it's all in heaven right church is one body so john there he is in heaven called up into heaven by the son of god called up into heaven by the son of god and chapter 5, no mention of church. Chapter 6, no mention of church. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I mean, you, we could read the whole thing verse by verse if you wanted to, but there's, there's no mention of the word church through the rest of that book all the way up until, uh, is it 21 or 22? Does 21 make mention of the church? I don't think it's mentioned anymore as far as the word church. Yeah, I don't think you'll find the word church. Uh, I thought it was mentioned again later on at the end of the book. Let me see here. Bear with me one moment. Oh, the last mentioning of church itself is Revelation 3.14. Now, look at uh, 22.16. There it is, 22.16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Oh, churches. I was looking under church. Okay. And the bright and morning star. So, Amen. I mean, there you have it. No, no mention of churches uh, from basically Revelation 4 when they're caught up into heaven, all this focus on the tribulation till we get to the new heavens, the new earth, and then we mention the churches again. It's just very interesting. You don't find the church in that uh, scripture dealing with the tribulation. Of course, it's the time of Jacob's trouble, not the time of the church's trouble. And of course, when would the judgment seat of Christ occur? If not during the tribulation. So while God is pouring out his judgment and his wrath upon the earth, and that's for who? The people that dwell upon the earth. Huh? I'm, in, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. God's judgment and condemnation and wrath is being poured out upon the dwellers of the earth. I don't belong here. I'm, I'm just a pilgrim right now. Hey Amen. All right. Um, I got a few points I can make. I found earlier, and I also found that document that I was looking for as well. Uh, I'll just I'll just throw this out here. I know we probably already um, over answered Isaac's question, <laughs> um, but nevertheless, I mean, I think this is a problem with a lot of people because they 
they would divide over pre-tribulation, post-tribulation. And I don't think we ought to divide over those things. If you Do you believe that Christ died for your sins and rose again the third day? Amen. I, should, I shouldn't have to divide my fellowship from you if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what people do? They, they say you're of the devil if you believe in the pre-tribulational rapture. They say that they can't fellowship with you no more. And they get bitter and they get angry if you don't see it the way they do. I can fellowship with somebody that believes in post-tribulation. I don't got a problem with it. Um, the problem is what they have with me because I won't conform to their doctrines. And so, again, Ephesians teaches our unity should be on in Jesus Christ and the, the correct gospel. OK, so really quickly, I'll just throw these out there. Number one, the Lord promised the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. If we're going through the tribulation, then the gates of hell did did prevail against God's church. So there, there's a reason why we're not going through the tribulation. That would be Second Thessalonians 2, 6 to 7. And now you know that withholdeth, and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. A lot of controversy along that the, the lines of that verse, but he who now letteth will let is uh According to sound teaching on the other clear passages of Scripture in the Bible, he who now letteth will let would be the body of Christ, which now restrains the influence of Satan until we be taken out of the way. Okay, now that's uh, Matthew sixteen eighteen is the cross reference that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And then... Um, uh, point two, in chapter two and three of Revelation, we read of the activity of the local churches, what Justin just read. Uh, chapter four begins with a call, come up hither. This call matches First Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, which is come up hither. OK, what well, we're going to be going up with Jesus Christ in the air. OK, now point three, after the rapture of the church. John finds himself instantly before the throne in heaven, Revelation 4. The church on earth is not mentioned again, and, and, and as Justin mentioned, until that last part of Revelation right there. Okay, so number four, the time of tribulation is called Jacob's trouble, and the church shall be saved out of it. Now, you can get a better timeline going to Daniel 9.24, okay, or, or just read the whole, the whole chapter of Daniel 9. And then Jer Jeremiah, what, what Justin gave earlier, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And point five, the great tribulation is a time of wrath. Revelation 6, 15 to 17. It's the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath has come. Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18. Uh, cry there bitterly. I'm just, I'm, I'm pointing out key, key words within these verses. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and de desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick, thick darkness, day of the Lord's wrath. OK, that can all be found in Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18 and Revelation 15. If you look at that verse at the very end, it says the wrath of God. And then Revelation 61 the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Joel 2.31, the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Malachi 4.1, or 4.5, I mean, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Acts 2.20, the great and notable day of the Lord. Why is it notable day for uh, for people that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Because they don't have to go through that. I just need to take notes. That's uh, Jacob. Jacob is going through that. <laughs> okay. Now, Jacob is the nation of Israel. Okay. So there you go. Uh, the church saints are given promise that we are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation from the time of wrath. That's First Thessalonians 1 verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So there it is. Um, I, I got a few more points we could give. Proof church is in heaven during the tribulation. Go to Revelation 4, 
1 Peter 5, 2 Timothy 4, Revelation 1, uh, stuff that Justin quoted, Revelation 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 3, Revelation uh, 4, 4, uh, who are the 24 elders? There, uh, I mean, if you line up the 24 elders and you try to line them up with Jews, they, it doesn't match. It doesn't fit. Who gets crowns? Does a Jew ever get a crown? No, Jews don't get crowns. The church gets crowns. You can read all about that in Timothy and other passages. So the 24 elders are members of the church. Okay, so there you go. Um, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I guess I'll end it there just to see if there's any more questions on here. Okay, amen. So um, Isaac says... You answered some, but I have my own thoughts on the rapture. But I love listening to what others think. Okay, amen. That's fair. Amen. All right. Do we have any other questions? Because if not, we're going to resume back to our topic in our agenda, which was, is God sovereign or do humans have free will? Is God sovereign or do humans have free will? You want to continue on, brother? You want me to go ahead and get in yeah, on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll add one more, one more point to this. Uh, <clears throat> if, if you would, get 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll read it, and then we'll consider the implications thereof. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse number 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, or uh, buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be, re be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be, shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what did we just read? It's a passage on what we call the judgment seat of Christ, right? So wouldn't, that all, Christ. wouldn't that all be a God's accountability, not man's, whether you get a reward or not? See? According See, to Calvinism? This is the implication. <laughs> this is the implication. If, right. if God foreordained everything to be the way it is, why would anyone get a reward? You right. didn't do right. anything. You didn't choose to do anything. It wasn't your will to do anything. It wasn't your desire to do anything. It was God's will and God's purpose. And so some people God chose to do things and some people God chose to not do things. Some people God chose to put in hell and some people God chose to put in heaven. That's not how it works, clearly. Because here you have God telling you, if you labor, God will give you a reward according to your labor. God's going to give you a reward based on the things that you do with your life here and now. That's how this works. God says you can build upon that foundation gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Now, wood, hay, and stubble, they won't abide the fire. They'll be burned up, useless works. And we that'd be a whole nother study in and of itself. But but at the very least, you have works that won't be reckoned for reward and works that will be reckoned for reward done by the same person. And so it's completely a matter of what a man chooses to do with his life 
once he's saved. Of course, you see that no other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And you have to build upon that foundation. So a saved man or a saved woman can choose to live right and do right and serve God and earn a reward for it which completely stands in the face of the idea of a God who purposed and knew and foreordained everything to be from the foundation of the world. All right. Based on what you said, Dave Jermakit says, what takes away your reward? (laughs) 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 Okay. That is, you can definitely lose your, your reward. Let's at least agree on that. Right. Amen. Let's see. Uh, First Corinthians three, right? That's First where you Corinthians were at. Chapter three. Uh, trying to think here. It's in the epistles of John. Let me think about this here. Let's see. Well, when you read First Corinthians three, fit. Uh, around 15, it says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be sure. saved yes, by fire. But the reward is God's. That's what God gives you. But if your work is burned, there is no reward that could come with it because your works are tried by fire. So I don't know. Uh, I'm, you're probably cross-referencing some another verse, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in Second John, I found it here. So turn to Second John. Uh, if you're following along, Dave, look at Second John chapter number uh, seven. Second uh, John or chapter seven, verse seven. There is no chapter. Second <clears throat> John, verse seven. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, verse number eight. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Do you see that? Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. What's he saying? There are deceivers out there who deny now, when it says that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, who who is that? That's God manifest in a body of flesh. There are people who deny that. And God says, if you bear with him, right, for 2 Corinthians 11, you're going to lose your reward. So you and I, we've got to be careful as to uh, who and what we allow to influence others at least to our ability to do so um, with regards to doctrine in particular the deity of Jesus Christ look at what he says there um, that you lose not those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward and get with that 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 just so you can see what I was talking about here 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 <clears throat> says, uh, verse number one, would to God, ye could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For, why would somebody be corrupted from the truth? For, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, not God manifested in a body of flesh, see that, another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, which ye have not accepted. Look at what he says. Ye might well bear with him. You see, uh, and I, I guess probably Brother Ed and myself get a lot of flack from the idea that we're not very tolerant, right? We, we're, we're so narrow-minded, 
And people, people don't like that. But God says, I want you to be careful because in the name of tolerance and in the name of kindness, he says, you might bear with somebody preaching a false Jesus who's going to, according to the Bible, lead other people to hell. Right? There, there's not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Right? And God says, let that man be accursed if he's going to preach and teach another gospel or another Jesus. And Galatians, you read, he says, well, you, wouldn't, you shouldn't, with, you shouldn't uh, uh, stand for that garbage for one hour. <clears throat> just, just deal with it right off the bat. Don't bear with that. Don't allow that to be taught. Otherwise, you can lose your own reward. I mean, re reward, sure, that's good. That's important. It's wonderful. It's incredible. God would even do that. But how about just defending the honor and glory of your Lord? I mean, here's somebody who's coming and saying, uh, talking about Jesus, but it's a made-up Jesus, or it's a Jesus that he's teaching in denial of the scriptural truth about Jesus Christ. You sh you sh if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you should want to defend that. You should want to withstand that and, uh, and not allow that kind of foolishness to be taught. And uh, God says, if you bear with that kind of stuff, you can lose your reward. Uh, of course, uh, we read that other places there in the epistles. But go ahead, Brother Ed. Yeah, um, you were talking about uh, what takes away your reward. Um. There was a there was more than just one aspect of taking reward away. Um, what is my reward then? When I preach the gospel, I maybe make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, if I do this thing willingly, I get a reward. But if against my will, I know that the dispensation of, of the gospel is given to me. What am I doing not preaching the gospel? I got saved through believing the gospel. Why am I not giving anybody else the gospel? That's the idea. But um, I get a reward if I do it willingly. Now, we don't. I don't preach the gospel to people just to get a reward. I preach the gospel because of my relationship to Jesus Christ. And I know every, any other person out there, the only way they're going to be able to get right with God is to have a relationship with him. And you're only going to get that through the gospel of what uh, Justin just described. Now... Colossians 2.18. Now, the verse I just read was 1 Corinthians 9.18. Now, this other verse, Colossians 2.18 says, Let no man beguile you of, of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his mind. So there are things that you can do to lose your reward. And I would say the safest road to travel on, because we could go through every single one of these. We'd, we'd be here all night. But um, I would say the safest road to travel on is just honor God with a sincere heart and obey the words of God that teach you Christian conduct in the New Testament and obey those things. And the, the parts where it says, you know, abstain from fornication. Don't do this. Don't do that. Follow after righteousness. If you do those things, you won't have to worry about what takes away your reward. And I think preventative maintenance is better than you committing the sins and trying to try to find out how far back you can push the goalpost to see what you can get away with as opposed to just obeying God because you love him. So hopefully that's fair, uh, a fair answer there, Dave. Um, I know, I know a lot of these questions drive out of just out of curiosity and I know a lot of us aren't trying to push the goalposts back. We just, we're just curious. And I understand that aspect as well. Okay. So don't, don't think I took you the wrong way. All right. Let's go to the next one here. We have. Let me see. The, okay. We, we did that one. Okay, here it is. Um, Isaac says, you answered some, but I have my own thoughts on the rapture, but I love listening. I think we hit that one already, and then we, yeah, we did. We yeah, we we did that one. 
And then Isaac says this one afterwards. Missed missed a lot. Phone call. <laughs> Sorry about that, uh, Isaac. Um, can you please send me all your verses on the rapture to my inbox, please? I'll do better than that, Isaac. Um, I've got a book called The Blessed Hope on a PDF format. I can send you the blessed hope. It's a very, it's, I mean, really awesome literature on pulling all the verses out of the Bible that deal with the rapture and, uh, and explains it so you can understand it. And then when you go to the Bible and you read the Bible, it'll say exactly what the blessed hope uh, PDF file is actually saying. So um, again, uh, just to stress to you, Isaac, we don't form our doctrines and then go to the Bible, prove the doctrines. We read the Bible and then let the Bible teach us. And then we let the Bible form the doctrines and then we we write them down on a paper or whatever, just to show you our motive that we're, we're trying to do right by the Bible. OK, so if you want, I can send you that whether on Facebook or on email, if you want to give me your email address or whatever. OK. OK, so then he says. I would love to change my own mind on my thoughts. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I'm the same way. I want I want to get all the information on a matter. And if I'm going to change my mind about something, I want to be persuaded by the scriptures. Amen. Uh, so we've got another question here. Isaac's going off tonight. Amen. Okay, so are we to keep the commandments? Are we to keep the commandments? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw some stuff out there. That is such a broad question, Isaac, such a broad, broad question. When you say commandments, what context of, of what you're talking about? Do we have to keep the commandments? Is we speaking of we being Jews? Or is we speaking of we being Gentiles? Or is we speaking of we being the church? Now, if you're talking about the Jews, certainly the Jews have national law they're supposed to keep in the Old Testament. And then you have Gentiles, which don't have laws, but do by nature the things contained in the laws. These having not the laws are law to themselves. So they have governments that they live by. They have their own uh, laws written in their hearts and their conscience bearing witness of that that they live by. And so they have that. And then you have the church in which we are living by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and which is a different law than what was given to the Israel nationally and what's given to the Gentiles uh, in a, you know, in a more conscious way or in a more carnal way, which uh, they're doing by nature, these things. So it's a little bit different um, when you're dealing with a church dealing with keeping laws. So you can see how broad that question really is if if you're saying, are we to keep the laws or, or, or commandments? Then you have to decide, well, which commandments are you talking about? Um, there's over possibly over 613 commandments that were given to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Um, I've never even counted the commandments that we have to keep in the New Testament. I don't know, Justin, have you ever counted every single thing that the Lord no. asked us to keep in the New Testament? No, I haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, that's all I really got to say until, uh, Isaac, you get maybe more specific. I'm thinking your motive is, do we as Christians have to keep the commandments? That's That's what I'm thinking. And Justin, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would assume that's probably the most oft-repeated question um, or one of the most uh, dealing with do we as Christians have to maintain the, uh, the laws that were given in the Old Testament. And uh, I guess to give you a, a decent understanding of that with an illustration uh, that, that we've heard many times, I'm sure, if I write a letter to my wife and I say, um, meet me at, uh, at uh, the steakhouse on Friday night and I will buy you dinner, you can read that letter. I will not buy you dinner. I'm buying my wife dinner, right? But my letter was to my wife telling my wife that I was going to buy her dinner. If you read that letter, you can show up to the steakhouse, but I'm not going to buy your dinner. Uh, 
And so there are things in the Bible that are written to certain groups of people in certain periods of time. And uh, if you would get with me Romans chapter number nine, I, I hope this will help to clarify. We're going to start there. Romans chapter number nine. Uh, verse number one, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish my, uh, that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, whom are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So what did, what did God say? Who did the law belong to? If you're talking about the Old Testament law that God gave Moses, who did that belong to? Belong to the Israelites. God told the nation of Israel, I'm giving you this law to govern you in your land, in the land that I'm giving you. And uh, in, in the New Testament, we're taught... Um, just, for example, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Um, verse number 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of, a, of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So what is he saying there? Listen, don't let somebody judge you with regards to what you're eating, what you're drinking, as far as what's the context, the Old Testament law, the handwriting of ordinances, right? That was nailed to the cross, taken out of the way. And you can see uh, uh, another good cross reference to that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Uh, verse number six, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But of the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? What's he talking about? We have two things in view here. Um, we have uh, two different ministrations, two different... Uh, we have a New Testament, clearly. We have an Old Testament, obviously. And one is the ministration of death, right? Wit written and engraven in stone. What's that talking about? That's the law that God gave Moses. And that ministration of death, look at what it says, the glory, because it was glorious, right? That glory was to be done away. Verse number seven. Uh, verse number nine, look at this uh, same thing. For, the, for if the ministration of condemnation, there's the law, be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is, look at the wording there, done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. So we're comparing the Old and the New Testament here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And God's making reference to the fact that Moses, his face shined in glory when he came down the mount the second time with the tables of stone in his hand, the law the second time. And uh, and the Bible says, and, and makes the reference, of course, you know it's true, Moses died. That glory was done away. Right, His face isn't shining anymore like it was then. He's not alive anymore. Sure, I get it, he's in heaven with the Lord now. But, but what's our comparison? 
the Old Testament, which is done away because we have the New Testament, administration of life as opposed to administration of death. Now, I would tell you that we are not to be without law to God. God has given us instruction, commandment, all of which, I mean, the, the Old Testament, right, the quote-unquote Ten Commandments um, that were given in Exodus chapter 20, all of them, with the exception of one, are repeated in Romans 13 and other places in the New Testament. So I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not going to follow the law or keep the law because I just feel like it. I, I have New Testament revelation that tells me as a born-again Christian, I'm not under that. I've got the New Testament. That's what I'm under. And I'm called to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, follow after righteousness, preach the gospel. I mean, all, all, all matters of, of righteous living are covered in the New Testament quite completely. And, and God says that's what he would have us to do but with regards to specifically the Old Testament law given to the Jews, uh, things like eating uh, shrimp and pork and wearing mixed fabric, etc., I don't have to worry about any of that. And uh, go ahead, brother Ed. Hey, Amen, brother. Well, I, well said, brother. I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> hey, Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, yeah, but it's just rightly dividing the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, Second Timothy 2.15 tells us to do it. It's not some concept that we make up it subjectively in our own minds. The Bible tells us to be careful when studying the Bible that we know how to apply the Bible. And as I mentioned be at the beginning before uh, Justin started speaking was Justin was actually using the principle as he was talking about this concept of the law. Uh, there's Jew Gentile Church of God. You've got to know what group of people you're talking about. Uh, you got to know who God is dealing with and what group of people he's talking to. If, if God is dealing with the whole world, well, then you can apply it to the whole world, whatever he's saying right there. I'll give you an example. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So if if God if God only gave his son to the Jews, it would say, for God so loved the nation of Israel that he gave his only begotten son. So in John 3, 16, we can find a scope of who it's applied to, just like in the Old Testament that Justin was talking about. Um, you can go to the law that's given to the nation of Israel, the law of Moses, and you can find that it was given to that group of people, that chosen nation of Israel, that priesthood nation. And if you look in the New Testament, you'll see that, well, God is dealing uh, in conduct with the church, those that have believed and trusted in Jesus Christ. Now, the church consists of Jews and Gentiles. Okay, so whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile and you get saved, you're not Jew or Gentile anymore in the eyes of God. You are now the church. Okay, so the church has rules and ordinances that God has given to conduct the church and how they ought to be and how they ought to walk in fellowship with, with God himself. Okay, so just to try to get you an, an over a real broad overview of that. And, uh, you know, Justin was zooming in a lot more with that. And he did a really great job with that. But just to give you a, a zoomed out view, we've got to be really careful with what we apply to the church, as opposed to learning something in the Bible that you can use practically for the church. That's that's way different. Okay, I can learn from the nation of Israel what they did. And say, well, hey, you know, they had pride. Or look at what they did. They were going after the ways of the heathen. Now, I can take that and learn from it. But to sit there and take certain laws that were given to them, like Justin mentioned earlier, like the tassels on the clothes or uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. I got to put a tent, you know, put a tent up for however many days. I mean, I don't have to do all that because I am not a Jew living under national law. And if I break that law, I don't got to get stoned to death or cut off from the nation, put outside of the congregation. I don't have to worry about that stuff. OK, so uh, you've got to be very, very careful when handling this word of God. Find out. Uh, the context of the passage. Who is it? Who who's being talked about? Who who is writing it? Who are they writing it to? Why are they writing it? What's the purpose of the context of this chapter? You got to be very careful because 
you're going to end up, I mean, if you end up applying everything to the church, you're going to be in a mess. And that's what's going on with all the false doctrines out there in the world today is they're not applying the Bible correctly. All right. And I guess we'll move on. Good question, Isaac. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we have Dave again. Hey, appreciate you getting on here, Dave. Um, I know, I know you've been emailing me uh, and stuff and I appreciate your sincerity. And I just, you know, I just thank you for your desire to want to learn. And, uh, uh, I, I figured you might have got Facebook just so you could get on some of the Q and A's and, uh, we, we'll try our best, Dave, to answer some of your questions. Okay. So, uh, here we go. Dave Jermaket. Should we share the gospel to help people get away from Satan? So they may have life. If you're unsaved, will God give you too much that you can handle? Or is that for everyone? Hmm. Is that a first Corinthians 10, 13 uh, comment at the end? I think it is. I think that's what he's referencing. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd say let, let's deal with question number one uh, first. So should we share the gospel? to help people get away from Satan so that they may have life? That's, that's a very important question, Dave. And uh, I would say, of course, the biblical answer is yes. Look at uh, Mark chapter 16. We'll start there. Mark chapter 16, uh, verse number 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, that's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. See that the command of Jesus Christ, the great commission is that you and I, if, if, if you're saved, especially you should go out and preach and proclaim the gospel so that people can have life. I mean, think with me here just, just for a moment. If, uh, if you truly believe that you were a sinner who was condemned and on your way to hell and you called upon Jesus Christ to save you after someone shared with you the gospel, would it not therefore make sense for you to go out and share the gospel with others so that they could be saved as well? I mean, if you genuinely believed the only way to escape hell was faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you and I must proclaim it. You and I must preach it. Uh, Paul wrote, according to the, the, the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is me. Come on, we, we read it in Ezekiel 33. God said a watchman. If the watchman doesn't warn the people, he's to blame for their death, for their destruction. Now, they die in their own sin, but God holds some accountability to the man to whom he's given that place of uh, foresight, if you will, as a watchman. You and I, as saved, born-again Christians, we have the truth. We believe the truth, and what we would have to do is we would have to go, therefore, and give that truth to others so that they could live. We read it also in Ezekiel 33. God said he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked that he should die. But what do he say? Let him turn from his ways and live. And how would they have any hope to do that if you and I don't go and preach the gospel? Um, Amen. Brother Ed, um, go, go right ahead, brother. Yeah, sure. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ... I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse two in Romans nine, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And verse three, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul has a desire that Israel would get saved. Paul has a desire that they need to know the gospel so they could be forgiven of their sins. What is holding the Israelites back? Verse four, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. 
whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God bless forever. Christ came for them, but they are trusting in themselves being Israelites. They're trusting in their adoption. They're trusting in the glory and the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and their promises, but they're not trusting the giver of the, of the one who proclaimed the adoption. They're not trusting in the giver of the glory, the giver of the covenants, the giver of the law and the giver of the service of God and the giver of the promises. They're not trusting in him. So the problem is it's their heart. And that's why Paul had great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart. Because it's, it's a problem of the heart. They're trusting in everything but what God told them to trust in. These things were given so it would help them to trust God, not trust those things. So his conscience is heavy. His heart is sorrowful because he knows he wants them to be saved. And that, 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 that is a moral, that is a moral aspect of Paul right there that he's showing the, everybody that reads this is that your desire to want to see people saved ought to give you great heaviness and continual sorrow in your heart that they would receive the gospel of Christ. Now, um, there's other verses, you know, we could hit like Jeremiah. Uh, they, they call Jeremiah the weeping prophet because he, he wept for people because people were going to die in their own sins if they did not repent and turn back to God in the Old Testament. And you know what we're saying today? We've got the greatest gift of them all. We've got something greater than what the Israel had. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a Jew, who is an Israelite. And they rejected him. But not all Israelites have rejected him. That's, that's my point. If you're an Israelite today, you could be saved. You could trust in Jesus Christ to be saved from your sins. But it's got to come from the preaching of the gospel. You've got to believe the preaching of the gospel. That's going to take people like you and like me who are saved members of the body of Christ to go and have a heart for these people and tell them the importance of trusting the free gift of Jesus Christ so they don't have to die in their sins and suffer eternity in a lake of fire, whether they're a Jew or whether they're a Gentile. We have to have a heart for these people. We're saved. Look, praise the Lord. Glory to God. But how is anybody else going to get saved when the means that God uses, which is the church, is staying at home watching football games, staying at home drinking beer, stay, going out to the movie theater to entertain and amuse themselves when there's people out there dying and going to hell and they're looking at your testimony saying, wow, are you a Christian and you can't even tell people about Jesus? You know, I talked with a friend of mine. We were out on the street the other day, and he told me about a program that he watched where this guy was an atheist. And he said, I have respect for Christians that would walk up to me and tell me about Jesus because I, I know what they believe about hell, and I know that they believe Jesus Christ is the way for you to get out of that condemnation. That's what the guy said. He's a lost man. And he said, I have more respect for a Christian that will walk up to me and tell me about Jesus because it's a moral issue. If you can't tell me about Jesus, that means you want me to go to hell. That, that I was like, wow, a lost person said that. How are saved people knowing that they've trusted in Christ, not telling other people to trust in Christ? Didn't you want somebody to tell you about it? I did. I thank God that somebody cared enough about me to share with me the gospel. And I'm so thankful that now I'm saved that all I can do is woe is me if I preach not the gospel, what Justin said earlier. And so um, we ought to have great heaviness and continual sorrow in our heart for those that are out there in the world and try to get them to Jesus Christ. Amen, brother. You can uh, add to that if you want to. Sure. I mean, just, this is just such an important topic. It is. Uh, and we could it we could spend all day. It's all through the scripture. Look at Acts chapter one, just for a couple of brief ones here. Acts chapter one. Uh the Bible says in verse number eight, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. God God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he said when you get the Holy Spirit, 
right? Which nowadays, you, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. That's how that works. Romans 8, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. It's not some special thing you get after you get saved. No, if, if you've called upon Jesus Christ to save your soul, you are made a part of the church, Acts chapter uh, 2, and you have dwelling within you the Holy Spirit of God. For what purpose? To be his witness. To be his witness. Uh, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So God wants you to be his witness to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, Paul's writing, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. It's a commandment of God our Savior that we would go and preach the gospel. And if you are saved, that, that gospel, that is entrusted to you to go and preach to others. And, uh, I mean, man, it's, it's all, all through the scriptures we could probably spend all day. But think about the great impact Christianity has had on the world. And, and, and I, I, I know, you know, the Roman Catholicism and all that stuff. But, but think about this for a moment. Think about this for a moment. Before that even happened, before you had your first pope, the world was turned upside down. Why? Because people went out and witnessed for Jesus Christ. They won lost people to the Lord. Those people went out and won more lost people into the world or into the, into the Lord. And, and, and now, nowadays, I, there's this, and I guess they say they're Christians. I, it's hard for me to tell, but they say they're Christians and they, they wouldn't dare open their mouth and tell other people. That's, that's the whole basis of Christianity. You get saved by calling upon Jesus Christ, then you go and tell others. And then in the meantime, God wants you to live in a good, clean manner, commensurate with that gospel, so that when you open your mouth to tell other people, they'll believe you. That, that's it. You want the, the whole thing in a nutshell. There it is. You and I are saved. We are left in this world to go and preach the gospel. Otherwise, what would be the purpose in leaving us here? I'm saved. I got eternal life. What would be the purpose in me staying if not to serve God? And the way you serve God in this day and age, you live a good, clean, right life, according to the Bible, and preach the gospel. Teach others. That's the whole, that's the whole crux of the matter. You and I are supposed to study, preach, teach, read, fellowship, all of those things are built around opening your mouth and testifying to others the truth of God. Hey Amen, brother. I would say on the contrary, um, uh, concerning uh, uh, as far as the topic of preaching the gospel, on the contrary, according to our topic tonight, it would be completely absurd for a Calvinist to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, not preaching the gospel is pretty much Calvinism. If you say that God has ordained people to be saved, that you don't need to open your mouth for people, that is pretty wicked. And it's not scriptural because nowhere in the Bible will you find people shutting their mouths and not warning people uh, concerning God commissioning people to do things. Nowhere in the Old Testament will you find that. You'll find Ezekiel doing it, Jeremiah doing it. You'll find uh, Elijah doing it, Elisha doing it. All the prophets are doing it. And you know what? You know what they're getting in return? Stoning. They're getting uh, torment. They're getting punishment by the nations for it. Now, look what happened to Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. They got a burning, fiery furnace for just standing on the word of God. Look, look, we don't want to bow down to your stupid statue. And that's all that's all they did. 
I mean, they weren't even in some really deep doctrinal truth about the word of God. They were just saying, look, we just want to we just want to honor our God. We don't want to bow down to no statue. And they got thrown in a burning fire furnace for it. So if they can stand up for something that we think today is something as small as that, how much more with the greatness of God by giving his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his full glory. Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God himself coming down to earth. And how how could my God, my God that created me, a speck of dust, come down to this earth and die for me? How I mean, we don't even put this thing in the right perspective. But when we look at our God coming down to die for us, it's like, how could God put that much value in dirt? I'm just a speck of dust. And yet he saved me by his grace through faith and believing the gospel because somebody cared enough to tell me about it. Now, God says he's going to use people to do that. He's not going to he's not going to uh, let the Holy Spirit miraculously float around in the ether to uh, move upon people and say, wow, whoa, did you feel that? I got a goose pimple on my spine. Oh, I guess I need to trust and believe on Jesus Christ. No, the Holy Spirit ain't doing that. See, apart from your Calvinism, apart from your Pentecostalism, apart from all these other false teachings um, and, and all this charismatic uh, uh, garbage, the Bible is practical when it says that God uses his creation he uses his new creature, the church, that's infilled with the Holy Spirit to go out and open their mouths. You ready? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if they will not hear, they will not be able to have an opportunity to believe. If they don't have an opportunity to believe, whose fault is it? It goes right back to the Ezekiel 33 and Ezekiel 3 passage that uh, Justin was talking about that, look, I'm not free from the blood of all men. <laughs> so, um, look, I need to have my conscience clear. I can't preach to every single person on the face of the planet. That's not even practical or realistic, but I can certainly do what I can do. And that's all that God asks you to do is do what you can do to get the gospel to as many people as you can within the limits of reason that, that, that you're, you're able to come on. I mean, I've seen people go so far as to uh, go to the club four or five times a week. I've seen people almost watch football seven days a week. I mean, you can give yourself over to those things on the extreme level. Why can't we do as much for Jesus? And Jesus doesn't even ask us to do the extreme level. He just says, this is your reasonable service to do what you're supposed to do for me, because this is what we call the Christian life. And the Christian life glorifies God. The Christian life glorifies the things of God. The Christian life glorifies what God wants us to do. And he wants us to care about people, to tell them the life-saving gospel so their souls can be saved and have a relationship with him. Okay, hopefully that's fair. and um. Maybe we can get on to answering the, the second half of this. If, <laughs> amen, Justin. Yeah. If you're, it's, it's, it was important, though. I mean, I think it, it needed to be spent on. So if you're unsaved, will God give you too much that you can handle, or is that for, or is that for everyone? I guess he just means that when things happen to one person, is it unanimous that God is just dealing with that for everyone? Now, I don't understand the concept of God giving you too much to, ha to handle because that's really subjective based upon a one instance of maybe God uh, doing something to affect a sinner. Now, I agree with the concept of God doing things to affect a sinner, uh, maybe to get saved or, and, and I've got a, maybe a, a list here of a few things that, that we could mention just as to not make the, the, such a broad statement so objective as if everything that happens to lost people, it's, it's the cause of God. I don't, I don't believe that for one minute. I believe Romans 5, 12 that says, wherefore as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. 
sin is the cause of a lot of the downfall and a lot of the 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 the, the bad things that happen in this world, including sickness and other things. Um, people that have deformities, people that have uh, messed up brains, people that um, end up suffering because of other people. Um, you've got to take into account that people cause other people to suffer. Now, if your question is, well, are other people causing other people to suffer so um, they can be perfected? I doubt that. <laughs> um, now, God can use people to perfect people. I'm not saying that God can't do that. But you got to be careful because nobody can recognize that. That's a very hard. I, I'm, uh, look, let me just be fair. I'm not going to say nobody can't recognize that. Let me just say, if you can recognize that, you're a better person than I am because I can't recognize it. I can't recognize what's coming from God, what's coming from Satan, what's coming from, from the results of my sin and sowing and reaping. I can't recognize that stuff. Look, you sit there and say somebody's suffering some sickness because of some sin they committed 30 years ago. That's ridiculous. You don't know that. So I'll give you, here's a few examples just to get uh, the mindset right on this thing. OK, sometimes God allows tragedy to happen in someone's life in order for them to look to him. I agree with that with that premise. Number one, would the leper in Matthew 8 two come to Jesus if he would have been in perfect health? Would he have came to Jesus? Probably not. Maybe he would. Number two, what about the blind man? If he wasn't blind, would he have came to Jesus? And you, you find a lot of times people come to Jesus because of their sickness, because of their illness, because of their their downfall concerning their the way of life they're living. Um, Second Kings five, Naaman, the, the Syrian captain had leprosy because if he didn't, he wouldn't have turned to God. That was a result of his pride. In, in uh, Daniel 4, 30 to 37, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, didn't humble himself until God made him spend seven years on his hands and knees like an animal. Why did God do that when, you know, you, you just, hey, just believe on me and you'll change your mind? No, sometimes bad things have to happen for people to change their minds. I'm not saying that God exclusively uses that way, but that is a factor. It, uh, Saul of Tarsus, who later became known as the Apostle Paul, was persecuting the church until God blinded him on the road to Damascus. See, we have a hardened heart, somebody that didn't want to come to Jesus when he could have, but because of the act that was placed upon him, the sickness or what we see blindness here, he turns to Jesus Christ. God uses suffering to bring others to Christ. John 11, John 11, 45, John 12, 11, um, John 11, 6. Uh, some Christians suffer because of the chastisement of God. Revelation 3, 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous and repent. Hebrews 12, 6 to 8. You have the chastisement right there. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. So this is dealing with Christians suffering. Why does God allow Christians to suffer? Well, because otherwise they would probably end up going down the road of sin. That's why. So to say that something bad happens to you is always because of God's willingness to punish you because you've been bad is, is beside the point. Um, he can use those things, but he can, he can also use things to perfect you. OK. And as we said earlier, he can use things to draw people, lost people to Jesus Christ himself. OK. So um, and I have a few more points like some Christians suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you say about those guys? You got people suffering for the cause of Christ overseas. Um, people die uh, because of persecution, because of their faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. What about the people that died in, in the in the lion's uh in the lions arenas and stuff, you know, they were, they were eaten. And uh, you've got the, the, if you read the voice of the martyrs, you can learn about persecuted Christians in the church all over the world. What about the Fox's book of martyrs? You can read about uh, Peter and other people, how they got uh, crucified upside down and boiled in water and, and so forth. Why did they have to suffer? Come on. If God is so good, why does he allow them to suffer? Well, well, it's the point that, there are things that we have to go through as Christians because of free will. This goes right back in our, our uh, Calvinism uh, thing. It, it, and people suffer because of free will. I got the free will to do right and give you the gospel. 
You got the free will to not receive it and torture me. I got the free will to turn my back on Jesus because you tortured me and torture you back. <laughs> but I, but I, I have the free will not to do that and not retaliate and just hold to my trust in the Lord. Okay, so there you go. Uh, God teaches Christians valuable lessons through sufferings. Uh, he teaches humility. Sometimes God puts us through some things to make us stronger, to perfect us. God uses sufferings to teach us patience. Some suffer to uh, to comfort others in their suffering. And I've got verses for all these. It's all scriptural. I can use these things. And in the most most of all, in the pinnacle of all this of what we're talking about, about the unsaved, will God give you too much that you you can handle, or is that for everyone? You know, when we're lost and undone. All of us were lost and undone. Jesus Christ took the suffering upon himself. The suffering of all mankind, all the suffering that you say you're going through right now, Jesus Christ already took that. Every every infirmity that you have, every iniquity that you have, every transgression that you've ever done, Jesus Christ already took that upon himself when he died on the cross for your sins. That's why we don't, you notice we say Christ died for our sins. What does that really mean to you? And most people don't really understand it, that he literally took all the sins of the world upon himself and the consequences that come with it concerning the soul and died for those, paid, and, and he made the transaction for us to be forgiven. But the point being, you have to trust and believe on him to be saved. But the fact that he suffered, should tell you that you have somebody that you can go to that has, and that's a Hebrews chapter four passage right there. Um, he's, he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That's why we can come before the throne of grace and we can ask God to comfort us through these things. We can get grace through the time of these things. The Bible never says he'd take away your infirmities. The Bible never said he would take away all your sicknesses. The Bible does say that you can, can, can have comfort and grace to go through those times of trouble because you have Jesus Christ to go through those things. And um, uh, Justin, if you want to add anything to that. No, I think that, that very well covered it. <laughs> and uh, all the different aspects of it. So uh, I'd say that's... that's right Amen. On. All right. So, all right, let's 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 move on. I've got a lot more people asking questions now, praise the Lord. All right. We've got Scott Messenger. It doesn't matter what we think in our opinions, Isaac, but what God actually says and we know what God says about the church getting caught up with Jesus Christ in the air before the time of Jacob's trouble. That is why we are to rightly divide. Okay, amen. Yeah, um, but give Scott, give Scotty a chance to, or, or give uh, Isaac a chance to learn that. Scotty, he doesn't, he doesn't know our, our the, the biblical side of it, the argument we're given. So I'm going to send him that information. He gave me his email. I'm going to send him that information through his email, and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, Isaac, you know, just get open mind and just learn it. And, and, uh, maybe later you can talk about it with us. We'd be more than willing to talk about it with you. Okay. Amen. All right. So we've got, let's do Dave Jermakit here. I believe we should share the gospel to help those that are hurting today because they can get healed by following him in present day, not just their soul in heaven. He helps me every day. Oh, wow. Um, go ahead, uh, Justin, if you want to. You, you want me to get a little bit of that? or I mean, it's, I'd say it's just along the lines you were just covering. <clears throat> You're not promised healing today. You're not promised um, all of your pain and trouble and, and, and those kinds of things being taken away today. In fact, the Lord said that we will have tribulation in, in this life. But the whole, the whole blessed hope is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to take us out of this. We're going to get a new and glorious body. A body that's not cursed with sin. And, and so, I mean, that's, that's all of our bodies. Now, God does see fit to, 
to uh, to heal people. Never, never a man waving a coat or any of that foolishness. But, but I mean, God did. God does work in people's lives, and and, uh, and He does help people and and get get you through some troubles and difficulties. And I get that. Uh, he can give you peace in those times and and help in those times, but uh, but we also want to be cautious to not get caught up on on the uh, on the side of things where where you're almost giving people a false promise or a false hope. Uh, you know, follow Jesus and he'll take away your your sickness or follow. You know, come uh, trust Jesus and you'll get out of this nursing home. <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. I mean, right. somebody's 85 years old, their body's racked with pain and cancer and trouble. And, and they, you know, if you told them, trust Jesus, he'll take it away. Not likely. Now, that part, <clears throat> if, if they trust Jesus, they die, they get a brand new body without sickness and sorrow and death and all that. So, so, you know, the, keeping things in perspective, yes, he certainly does heal and help and, and is a, is a, a, a shelter and a rock and someone to lean to and trust in and confide in to get help in your times of trouble. But, but um, salvation doesn't guarantee any of that. Salvation takes away my sin so I have eternal life and... Um, and it gives me a relationship and reconciliation to God who is not promised to heal me of any of my troubles and sicknesses. So. All right. Um, I'll, I'll add a little something to that. Um, go to second Timothy four twenty. Um, the Bible says in verse 19, salute Priscilla and Achilla and the household of Onesephorus. Erastus abode at Corinth. But Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. So, uh, Dave, if you want a biblical answer, what is Paul, the one that wrote at least 13 of our epistles in the New Testament, who's a saved member of the body of Christ and an apostle at that, what's he doing leaving people sick in Miletum? <laughs> um, you would have to get, come up with an answer to that because then you're saying that uh, Paul didn't have enough power to heal anybody because he wasn't saved. That's where that bumps into. Now, this doctrine of the healing uh, concerning Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Uh, you got to be careful with that passage because this is what we call the healing within the atonement. You don't get healing within the atonement concerning the body of flesh. The healing is concerning the sin in the soul only, exclusively. We still have a body and we still have a spirit we have to deal with. Uh, man is a spirit, soul, and body. First Thessalonians 523, if I'm correct. Uh, man is spirit, soul, and body. He is triune. The trichotomy of man is spirit, soul, and body. And the three are one. Okay, so if you understand that man has a spirit, soul, and body, then certainly God, Jesus Christ has healed our souls. Now, the cross-reference for the healing is in the second Peter passage, um, and it's dealing with, uh, by his stripes, ye were healed, or I, I, I might be misquoting that, but it's still dealing with the soul. It's not dealing with the body of flesh. Second Timothy 4.20 is our cross-reference. Um, Paul left um, Trophimus sick. Trophimus was still sick after Paul left. If if Trophimus was sick, why didn't Paul rebuke him for saying, Trophimus, you're not saved? Let me tell you what Jesus did. He came here to heal your sicknesses. But you'll never read that in 2 Timothy 4. Okay. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now go down to verse, go down to verse four, second Corinthians 12, verse four, how that he was caught up in the paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not, not lawful for a man to utter. We're not going to cover that topic. Go to verse five of such and one will I glory yet of myself. I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. What is Paul doing saying he has infirmities? What is he doing? If he's saved, if he's a saved member of the body of Christ and he has the a, a healing in the atonement, 
the healing of his body of flesh, why does he have infirmities? Look at verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. See, he's trying to put away his pride, because he knows he has pride. Verse 7. And least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. See, I, I've got revelation, guys. I wrote, uh, I, I'd say 12 or possibly 13 epistles. I've got revelation. God has used me as a vessel to write down his words. He's, he's got, if anybody's got good reason to be exalted, it would be Paul himself. And look what he says. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. But wait a minute, aren't we, isn't our topic right now the flesh? Being healed in the flesh? What is God doing giving him a thorn in the flesh? Now look what it says right here. It, it really gets uh, more interesting. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. So here you have a saved member of the body of Christ who God says, I'm going to send Satan to buffet you. That way you're not prideful and being exalted above measure because of the abundance of revelations that you've received from me. And then look at verse eight. For this thing I besought the Lord three, look, thrice. He asked God three times that it might depart from him. Now, Dave, did Paul not have enough faith in Jesus Christ when he believed on him initially? Is that why the Lord didn't take away those uh, infirmities from him? What was it? I mean, I'm not saying you're saying that, but I am saying that these are quest these are objective questions we ought to ask to make sure that we're not reading into the Bible something it doesn't teach. And that's why when we go to Isaiah 53, we say, by his stripes, we are healed or we were healed. You got to make sure you understand the healing being talked about there doesn't always mean a healing of the body of flesh. It could mean a healing of the soul or a healing of the spirit. You, you got you to gotta study the context. Okay, so be very careful with that. And then look at verse nine and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of close out with, with this. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my, infir in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How is the power of Christ going to rest upon Paul right there in verse 9? It's going to be by him glorying in his infirmities and just trusting in the grace that God has given him is sufficient. See, he's humbled himself. He's trusting in the grace of God through his infirmities, and that's what's keeping his pride at bay. I hope you understand that, okay? So there are purposes for infirmities, and we just saw that. So to sit there and say that um, by his stripes we are healed in Isaiah 53 means that you now have healing in the atonement concerning the body of flesh is completely and utterly unscriptural, okay? Hopefully we've reasoned that out and— uh and Justin can add whatever he wants. Amen. No, I'd, I'd say that, that that about covers it right there, definitely. Okay, so let's move on here. We've got, uh, okay, uh, Trisha Marks says, some of this goes back to all the Calvinism in the churches. Don't need to witness if one is predestined to be saved. Sad situation we have going on. Right. And that was in response. If I remember that, uh, Miss Mark, uh, that was in response to when we were speaking of the gospel. Uh, we were talking about the gospel. Yeah, right. And then uh, let's move on here. Scott Messenger says, need to tell the, the lost soul that Jesus will save their souls if they will believe what he did on the cross, right? Yeah, and that was when Justin was talking about the preaching of the gospel to everyone. And then we have Andrew Ray, Pastor Andrew Ray. Amen. Amen. I know I'm on late, but the problem on healing in the atonement comes from a misapplication of Matthew eight seventeen. Amen. Let's read that. I've never I've never looked at that passage dealing with that, so I'm looking at it right now that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias, the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Okay. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. But I've, I've actually heard it, uh, priest, uh, 
uh, brother uh, Ray. I've actually heard it preached um, Isaiah 53. And then they cross reference the second Peter passage on uh, by who, who stripes we are healed. And uh, they actually use that as that, uh, but they, I, I mean, they probably use that one as well, just like you said. So, I mean, I think it's, they, they, they grab all those verses and I think they even grab the verse in James as well. Okay. So there you go. Um, I know. Oh, here we go. I know I'm on late, but the problem comes from a mishap. Okay. He just, yeah, he said that already. Okay. Amen. All right. Well, appreciate you giving that verse there, uh, brother Ray. Um, Amen. That that sheds more light on uh, the understanding of why people would go to that that verse there and, and assume that. Amen. Amen. All right. Again, take scripture with scripture and you've got to reconcile all things in the Bible and make sure that it's consistent everywhere in the Bible. And that way um, you're not going to fall into some traps. Amen. All right. Um, do we have anything else? I don't think we have anything else, brother. So we can assume or we can resume back to our topic. Do we, you still got time? Um, I'd say it, it's probably a good time to wrap it up. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap it up there. Cause we've been on a long while. We, we've really been on a long while now. So um, I, I do appreciate everybody on here that joined us. And I appreciate your willingness to listen to the, the reasoning through the scriptures and have an open mind to to get the answers that we, we uh, so uh, diligently try to seek out for you. And I hope that you consider these things as you get off the scope and just consider what the answers that we gave. And for those of you that didn't get your questions answered, or you wanted a question answered, you can join us. We're doing this every Tuesday at 830 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. So that's Florida time. So if you're living in another country, just remember it's Eastern Standard Time, Florida time in the USA. All right. So um, I thank you guys for joining us on this scope of the Q&A. Um, again, if you have any more questions, you can also comment on my Facebook page or I'm pretty sure, Justin, you know, if you can give your Facebook uh, too, if you want to do that when you I'll, I'll let you speak for a minute sure. before we shut everything down. Um, thank you guys again for joining me on this uh, Bible scope and I'll just pass it over to Justin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course I'm, it's just Justin Whitland, just myself. I'll try and post it on here real quick. Make a comment. Uh, bear with me one moment. There we go. There we go. So, I mean, there, there's, that's my Facebook right there. So you're more than welcome to write me any questions you've got or, uh, uh like I said, join us next, next week when we do it again. Amen. All right. You guys have a good evening and may the Lord richly bless you guys. Amen. Good night.